Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time. I'm Tim Murdoch. And I'm Matt Emmert. And fans may remember today's special guest from Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning, when her character fell victim to a pair of gardening shears by the Jason copycat killer. Well, she's back on the horror scene, writing, directing, and starring in a new film that reunites some of the franchise's most beloved stars. It's called 13 Fanboy, and you can catch it in theaters and on demand starting October 22nd. Please welcome to the podcast, actor, writer, and director with a last name you'll never forget, Deborah Voorhees. Woo! We're so Hi, guys. Happy. Hi, how are you? I'm terrific. Thank you so much for having me on. Of course. Thank you for being here yes, with us. We're so you. excited. And may you I know- say y'all are kind of cute? Oh, oh well, you can well, say well, that, please. Again, again, well, considering this is an audio podcast, uh, that's hey, say it as many yeah. times as you want. Right back at you. Well, you look fabulous too. I know, unfortunately, listeners cannot see you, but um, Deborah looks fabulous. Absolutely. Um, and before we even jump into all the Friday the Thirteenth stuff, we read that you're originally from Texas, right? And so we're just interested. Yes. What was it like um growing up there? And did you always know you wanted to go into acting? Well, um, I, I think I did early on. Um, initially, I would have said I came about um, at about 18, 19 years old. But uh, the truth was, I went through some old boxes and my mom had an old paper of mine from third grade. Wow. And said that I was going to grow up and be a writer and an actor. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I did. Wow, talk about putting something out into the universe and the universe kind of like delivering, huh? I'll tell you what, I, I, it is unbelievable what the universe will deliver for you if you want it. And what you hear the most and what you invite into your life, they'll also give you that. So you got to be careful. <laughs> Amen. Watch your spheres. <laughs> Speaking of Texas, I read that you originally started out on a TV and had a seven episode arc of Dallas. Yes, that's right. I did. Yeah. Who did you play? Like, do you remember what happened to your character? Actually, um, a, a different characters, believe it or not. Um, I also did several extra roles, but those are the speaking roles. Um, I did um, several different things. I was the queen of the oil barons ball one year. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was a regular waitress. Um a few times and you know several different things um i met bobby bobby ewing at a bar one time wow so, yeah. yeah i yeah i remember on shows they could do that like on three's company um on the sitcom they always had characters play multiple people but now with everything being documented like it's right. so much tar- harder to do that right yeah they just give it enough time between the characters yeah <laughs> wow, that's really cool. So in seven episodes with multiple characters in it, that's great. Right. I mean, well, they typically, most often they would refer to me as Debbie Sue. So I guess they kind of felt like I kind of could fit in and be those char- that character. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, um, uh, Larry Hagman referred to me as Debbie Sue on film. So <laughs> kind, of, wow. kind of funny. I mean, Dallas was like the show of oh, the yeah. 80s. It really oh, was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was so much fun. I actually didn't just get to perform in it. I actually worked um, behind the scenes as a stand in. And that was actually the most fun because I was there every day. And um, when I'd walk on set, Larry Hagman would start singing uh, to the Peggy Sue song, Debbie Sue, I Love You. Oh, that's amazing. I oh wish Larry God. would sing to me. Yeah, to me, say <laughs> Timmy, uh, so I'm not so sure. But that, that's really cool. Like, I mean, that you had that relationship with them. Oh, that's that's awesome. So before we uh, jump into Friday 13th, The New Beginning, were you a fan of horror films growing up? I mean, like, were they on your radar? I mean, did they affect you when you were young? The kind of films that I saw, um, I, I was pretty much a, a big chicken. So I was definitely had to have somebody else with me to watch one. And if you commit to watch a scary movie with me, you also have to commit to a certain amount of time afterwards. 
I get because that. Because like, I'm not like left immediately alone. <laughs> right, right. Like after a, like a horror film, I like to like watch an episode of like a sitcom, like the Golden Girls. Just to- exactly. Ditto. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> Got to cleanse that palate so I can have nice sleepy time. <laughs> yes. Were there any films that stuck with you? Like, do you remember as a young age? Um. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I've always loved the Universal uh, monsters. Okay. You know? old universal monsters um in fact one day i'd love to do a an origin story on frankenstein where you're with him the whole time you, that's who we're talking about um then um i loved uh now this isn't this is horror but not like super horror but dark shadows oh when yeah did, that was a big deal and um i remember uh being on uh the floor and my dad came over because I was next door to neighbors and we were watching it on TV and I'm like grabbed a hold of his leg and I'm holding it like this because I'm a little girl. And he goes, are you scared? <laughs> <laughs> Which now if you watch Dark Shadows, you'd be going, you're scared. Why? <laughs> like, oh, I know. Sometimes six, I watch five, when I was little, do not hold up the same way. <laughs> right, right. Um, the Exorcist. Yes shit out of me two weeks of not sleeping um i loved oh one of my favorites i love the uh well my all-time favorite is the bad seed oh yeah Ooh. nine serial killing pick, blonde pigtailed little girl that you, you just don't get any scary because it's the last person you expect yes and then um psycho Psycho is just freaking amazing. Of course. I agree. I love that. So I'm a little older than you guys. So my growing up years, those were the movies that I saw. Well, you picked some good ones. Yeah, those are some really good ones. I, um, you know, moving into Friday the 13th, part five and new beginning. Well, first off, randomly, just out of curiosity, when's the last time you watched it? <laughs> Friday, um, part five. Let me think. Um, wasn't that long ago? go it was for a group showing i was supposed to see it i went to flashback weekend in chicago and it was supposed to um have it there but they had some technical difficulties so i don't know if that actually happened or not uh but um gosh probably about a year Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah, that's fairly recently. Yeah. And so, you know, I know you've you've spoken about the audition process before, but we'd love to hear about like when what was the audition process like for the role of Tina? Like, what did you have to do? What did they tell you about the role? Right. Um, it was a um, cattle call. There were just lines and lines and lines of people when I went through and um, I went through three different auditions. First, kind of like a general one. A walkthrough and then they decided if they were going to basically they hardly looked at your stats at all they basically give you a one up and down do you look like the role I was sent out by my agent for the role of Tina because I fit the part and um you know they do one of these and yeah she could play that you know he could play that could play that you know kind of thing and you go through and read I know some people read for more than one part they kept me to Tina the whole time. I'm just thinking how intense it is to have someone like look at you and be like, like, yep or no. <laughs> but I right. guess you just have to get to a point. I mean, I, I, where you, you just, just don't let it bother you. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe no doesn't mean anything bad. Maybe they just didn't. They don't see you as that role. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I remember when I went into one of my agents when I was in uh, Los Angeles and um I was interviewing with uh, the male agent and a female agent came in and um, he was talking to her about signing me. And she did. She gave me a look up and down. Yeah. Sign her. I can sell her whether she can act or not. Uh, (laughs) You're like, guess what? I can act too. (laughs) I was like, cool. I'm okay with that. (laughs) Have have you seen the previous Friday 13th films or were you? I saw the first one. Oh, so when you got the part, is that when you went back and saw the first one? You'd already seen it. No, I'd already seen the first one then. Yeah. Oh, okay. Awesome. So did you think, were, did you um, think, oh, I don't really need to see part four or something leading into it? Or had they told you, oh, this is kind of a new type of plot? It, yeah, it, we knew that it wasn't really related anymore, that it was something 
you know, no, because that's what it's called the new beginning. So <laughs> you're like, I'm good with the original. I, mm-hmm. I feel like if you only watch the original, you're like, uh, okay, so there's no more Jason. I mean, maybe it's the originals, Mrs. Voorhees. You're like, well, we're good. We're good. No, you just we're good. It no, I am. Um, um, so I know you've been asked this a million times. This is kind of a cheesy question, but what were your thoughts when you first realized that your last name was the same as like the killer's last name from the entire franchise? And how did the director and crew react to seeing that? I would, the one thing I remember the most was when I was going through the cattle call. And somebody saw my thing and they just started laughing. <laughs> really? I went to the bank about a, three years ago. And believe it or not, I had a check from uh, Michael Myers. <laughs> my, wait, so Michael Myers wrote a check to Checked. Ms. Voorhees. <laughs> oh, a check. <Yeah. laughs> that is like and the bank gold. teller just lost her shed right <laughs> that is amazing <laughs> you know um speaking of the director of part five you know w- w- it's a subject that we've heard and read various kind of conflicting accounts and i'm just wondering with danny steinman what was your experience um working and interacting with him you know he was always really kind to me and in fact he's the one who uh pushed for me to have the role they had another woman for the role that he wasn't content with. Um, he felt like he really did. She didn't really understand uh, Tina. You know, I think if he had spent a little time explaining her Tina to her that she would have adjusted just fine and it would have been great. But um, very often in Hollywood, they want you coming in, being the character. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you get the role just because you interpreted it properly. And which is really a big guessing game because, you know, we're actors, you know, just give us some instruction and tell us if we're not doing what you want and we can work it differently. Um, But uh, the big thing was, is the other actors, this is what the director told me, came in and when Tina says to um, her boyfriend, fuck you, um, the other ones were doing it angry. Whereas, I mean, this is, you know, your boyfriend, you love your boyfriend, you care about your boyfriend. You're not going to say that in an ugly manner is my point of view. My point of view is be kind of flirty and that you, you know, cause you're like going, hmm, maybe, <laughs> you know, <laughs> No, no, that's uh, exactly. I mean, like, it wasn't like that part wasn't an argument. It was flirting, you know? Right, exactly. And so he just happened to like it. But if the, he didn't like that and he liked the anger, somebody else would have gotten it, you know? No, well, hey, well, that's great. And then we have you here today. I mean, I, um, and speaking of your boyfriend in the film, John Robert Dixon. So mm-hmm. look, I can only imagine how awkward it must be to film a love scene in front of a crew and everything. But here's the thing, what Tim and I really want to know, because I don't think people have ever asked this about that scene is, <laughs> okay. so in this movie, they don't show any male nudity, which is totally right. uncool. And <laughs> totally uncool. Totally Wrong. Uncool. But what we want to know is, was hottie John Robert Dixon, did he have to be fully naked during filming of that too he did, mm-hmm. he did. so he mm-hmm. did not no modesty pouch no nothing Mm-mm. wow we you didn't know. do that back in the day i i hear i only learned that they do that now i just learned it after i filmed 13th in and it never even occurred to me you know what i am so happy Something to hear like that, that so that the awkwardness was like equal on both sides you know because everybody, they don't talk about that part because unfortunately the film doesn't show male nudity, you know. In right. It, but, wow. Right. I, well, and there is a double standard. And I even saw it on my film set. And, you know, I kind of had to laugh about it because there's a scene where Haley and Andrew, Andrew had to be fully naked and she could be partially naked. And so it was kind of like a joke on set. <laughs> Uh, you know, Haley, are you okay? Are you fine? <laughs> I don't care if you're okay with your nudity or not, Andrew. You're fine. Deal with it. I, I think there's just kind of, I think it's just because for so long, you know, in our socialization, we don't put as much emphasis on male nudity. Um, but I will give you guys a little secret about women. We are very visual creatures and we do like to see you naked. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to we give are. you a little... I'm We're not give... any different than you guys. I'm, I'm... Anyone who tells you differently is lying to you because probably one, she's embarrassed 
and doesn't want to admit to it. But having the advantage of having the girl time alone, trust me. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you a little secret about gay men. We also like to see men naked. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and yes. So, exactly. So. See, that's how it should be. We need to, people say, well, maybe we shouldn't have more female, we should have less female sexuality on the screen. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'd be a hypocrite because I want to see more male so we can't take away the female, otherwise I'm being a hypocrite. Because I do. I will watch a Brad Pitt movie. I mean, I absolutely love him as an actor too. But at the off chance, he might take his shirt off. Or he might get a butt shot. Yeah. Check, check out the I'll movie. Watch it. Troy, uh, the Thelma and Louise. <laughs> Not that I've done research on Brad Pitt naked. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, I <am>. uh, no, <laughs> no, that's amazing. And truthfully, you're t you're totally right. It's like you don't have to minimize one; just get it a little more equal. <laughs> right, right. Just let us have our little, you know, treasures. <laughs> exactly. Well, so and now, then like there's this one scene we were shooting, and uh, my camera operator he had Andrew like this. Well, he's absolutely has a gorgeous body. I'm like hello the girls would like to see more you know he's in his underwear he's got a six-pack ab you know <laughs> put in the work one of my one of my um crew members happened to be gay and when i came out from that uh from shooting that scene he gave me a hug he goes oh thank you <laughs> Oh my God! Well, this is this yeah, is great. I can't I mean, wait we we haven't even gone to the thirteen fanboy section already. I'm very yeah. I'm getting yeah. I'm getting a little warm. Andrew here. is extremely hot. Yeah. I did see his He's picture. He's so good on looking a... that it hurts your eyes to look at him because it's like staring into the sun. Oh my God! Wow. You heard embarrass him, him. I haven't said that to him. <laughs> uh, Andrew, it's like looking into the sun, which is wow. like incredibly. I'm trying to think powerful, impactful, and can burn right through your soul. <laughs> right. He's also happens to be a super super nice guy. It was fun listening to the other guys on set, and they were all like, "If he wasn't such a nice guy, we would." him yes. right exactly I'm like right yeah, i know <laughs> well um you know moving forward on on part five of getting to your death scene which sadly mm -hmm. is after the love scene I, i've um you know i've read that the makeup that they used to cover your eyes after they snapped them with the gardening shears was not the easiest thing to deal with what was it like filming right. that scene how long did it take to apply that makeup the application for the makeup took about three hours and um, because it was actually very thin and you wouldn't think it would, but since it went like right here and you had to make it so that you couldn't see any difference between that and my skin. So there was a lot of work to do. And then they had to paint the, the darkness and the black in and some red that would be solid. And then they had to put the pools of blood in there as well. Aye, and aye, aye. It, you know, the um, two things were really difficult about it, uh, but it, it, I'm not complaining because it was all great. I loved every minute on the film set. Um, one was it was already awkward being naked on the set. But being naked and can't see. Oh, God. Added another level. <laughs> Wow. So yeah. you you probably like and I, to... but at the same time, I mean, I couldn't have had a more professional set and nicer people around me who took really good care of me, including Danny and the producer and you know the other people on set. You know, they always made sure I had a robe and you know, when I was having to wait between shots with the eye stuff, you know, they lead me to my chair and help me out and different things like that. So it, it really, um, they were just really nice. And it, you know, it was the first day on the set that we shot all of that. Wow. Jeez. Really smart because it's like, you know, I'm somebody I would much prefer somebody to rip a bandaid off and then you get all the hairs on your arm go up at once instead of one at a time, you know, it's so much more torturous, you know, it's like, just do it fast. And so you just get it done. And, um, and then, you know, you're rap relaxed for the rest of the time on set, you know? Yeah. Is that the time you bonded with the other cast? I mean, who did you bond with the most? Um, on that set, 
Uh, I talked quite a bit with the producer. He was really nice. Um, Matt uh, was somebody else that I, I spoke with a bit. And um, there are a handful of people that I, I talked with and, and visited with. You know, um, people were pretty nice on the set. I really liked them a lot. And now that we're going to conventions and stuff, you know, I've got a really nice bond with a handful of the people like Ron Sloan and he and I have become good friends. And Tiffany is somebody I greatly admire and we become friends and um, Carol Locatel as well. And uh, so um, there's a lot of really neat people on set where, you know, we'll actually talk. So when the when the movie was all filmed and complete, was there a red carpet premiere or a cast screening? There was a, a um, premiere and that was a lot of fun. Um, it was a packed theater, of course. And um, that was a lot of fun to see. But what I did after that was I decided I wanted to see what a general audience would be because a Hollywood premiere is very, very different because there's certain types of people there. Mm -hmm. Really your general fans. I'm sure there were some that were general fans, but mostly it was Hollywood types. So I wanted to go to the theater and see what it was like. And so I sat in the back and just watched and observed. And it was so much fun to watch because um, people were really excited. You know, it was definitely event, an event. You know, they were laughing, carrying on, they were having fun. And uh, so that, that was kind of exciting to see. That's so cool. I mean, that's that's the thing. That's it. I totally get what you're saying. Like, we always ask people about the premiere, but it's like you really don't get the real feel until you go just to a general audience because that's fans. I, and speaking of that, it's when do you feel like you first became aware that there was such incredible fandom behind the Friday the 13th series? Like, was it just seeing it then? Or I mean, did you ever think you'd be still talking about this movie 36 years later? No, I never did. Um, that was, yeah, a huge surprise. Um, it was several years after the film. Um, actually, I guess it was really social media that started getting me to understand. Because I had over time, people would contact me. I was a journalist with the Dallas Morning News and the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And people would find me that way and send in um, autographs there. But it was much more difficult to find me in that time period. And so it wasn't until I got on social media and I was like, oh, shit, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of people. <laughs> yeah. Love this. So you've attended the film conventions, uh, the, um, the horror conventions. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, who what what's the most the, like common question that fans ask you at the conventions and things? Oh, usually it's something about my nude scene. If they <laughs> the courage. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> really? Well, I mean, oh, do um, do you see a lot of people from the film at conventions or the people you had mentioned that you've built a bond with or those kind of the ones that attend conventions? Co -stars? Yes. Right. Usually at a convention, it'll be like myself and Tiffany and Ron, Kara Locatel, Melanie, mm -hmm. and um, this last time Dick Wien was there, and then um, sometimes Tom Morga. So kind of, you know, switching off. between you know, John Shepard, I think. Sh Schaefer. <laughs> did you just Actually, I did see John Shepard at one. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh okay. wow. How about Shavar? Does he come Shavar to conventions? Ross? I don't know. I haven't seen him. Wait a minute. I'm trying to think. Did he go? There was one in Texas, the same one that John Shepard was at. I'm trying to remember if um, Shavar went to that or not. I can't remember for sure. I wish I could tell you. Yeah, he, no, um, it, we had talked, we've, we had Melanie Kinnaman on the podcast and I think she's kept in touch with him some and is talking about the conventions and just seeing all the fans and just the absolute love for this film, you know, and obviously mm -hmm. we ourselves are fans, which is, makes this so special, but, you know, do you want to shift gears into your upcoming film? And before mm -hmm. we jump right into 13 fanboy, I'm just wondering, when did you kind of make the shift in your career to working behind the camera? Because I, I noticed 13 fanboy is not the first film you wrote and directed. Right. It was about 10 years ago. Um, actually, no, I guess about 12 years ago. And, um, you know, I, after I left journalism, 
um, I went uh, back to school and I decided that I was going to get my teaching certification to uh, become a teacher because I had some amazing teachers and I really wanted to um, kind of give back and um, not fully thinking it through on the nudity and Friday the 13th because to me that was not a big deal. I don't really get the why people think it is. To me, it's kind of strange. It's a natural part of our bodies. And so why would that be a problem? But And so the schools had a problem with the nudity. They were fine with my eyes being gouged out. Such a such not hypocrite. The, I know. Not a little I mean, don't get me started on how violence is so much more accepted than just showing people's natural body parts. And that is like nude in two plays. I've been naked on stage, fully naked on stage in theater. Ooh. And so yes, so I am a big I mean a big a, yeah. big <laughs> proponent of and if people have a problem with it, then they can go F themselves. <laughs> right. It's it's a really strange thing. You know, there's a, one of my favorite quotes is from Shakespeare, and it says, um, nothing is either good or, or bad, but thinking makes it so. And this is a perfect example of it. There is nothing wrong with nudity. If you have a problem with nudity, it has to do with your belief system, perhaps how you were raised or your own chosen belief system. But in of itself, there is nothing wrong with nudity. It yeah. makes sense. I mean, the men, you guys take off your shoes, sh your shirts, and you show off your boobies. You guys have boobs. Yeah. <laughs> some flatter, sometimes harder, sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> you got nipples. But somehow or another, yours is deemed non-sexual and a female's is deemed sexual. And it's like, well, well, even if they're both deemed sexual, why is that bad? Because without sex, we don't procreate. And so that is bad why. So once again, we fall into this trap of believing what we were raised with. And it's really, it's a curious thing to see what happens and why this would be deemed as bad. It's, yeah. I, I find it absolutely baffling. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. I mean, um, um, when you so when you got into you know working more behind the camera did you realize did you find yourself having more satisfaction out of working behind the camera or do you still prefer acting to writing and directing oh no directing is absolutely my number one favorite by a long long shot wow um because you get to take all of the pieces together and pull them together and to make it into something mm -hmm. Working with other actors is fantastic. Um, working with um, crew members, um, is starting it out with writing. Uh, Joe Paul Reisick and I both wrote it together. He's my producing partner on this. And then taking that as in a producer role as well, because I took on that role too, and um, then turning it into a movie. Taking... And horror in particular is an absolute favorite of mine to direct mm. because there's this magical aspect of it. You're a bunch of kids on a film set playing in buckets of blood, <laughs> making, making things look like there's a wound when there isn't one, making this, the hit of the knife and with the sound and stuff, trying to make it look like somebody was actually stabbed and they're actually in dire pain and there's blood and so that's a lot of fun. It's like a magic trick. It I agree. People into thinking something bad has happened. And then when you start putting in the sound effects, the sound design, which by the way, we have an amazing sound design artist, uh, Barack out of London and my um, uh, uh, music, the guy who composed everything, his name's Tamer Surrey, brilliant. Wow. And you know, as you know, as horror fans, 51% of the movie is that sound. Oh, yeah. Try and watch a horror movie without sound. It's no, my gosh. Yeah, 
I, I always go back to the famous John Carpenter said he showed like an executive, the original Halloween before they put the sound in and they're like, oh, it's not scary at all. And then suddenly when the soundtrack came in, it was the most terrifying movie of its time. I, he's a yeah. huge Halloween fan. I prefer Friday 13th. I think the score for Friday 13th is amazing. <laughs> well, wait a second. I mean, I still love, I still love Friday. No, I was just thrown under the bus by my co-host. No, he I did throw you under. <laughs> Boy, that was bad. How dare he? <laughs> I'm not going to pretend I do Halloween, you know, like the movies that had an effect on you, the original Halloween, I was obsessed with growing up and that, that right. series. I do love, love, love the Friday the 30th series and the music is incredible, but I a hundred percent agree. I'd even say like maybe 61% I, is I, the music. I of course love both scores. <laughs> I'm more, I'm Look more at, t- political Tim. <laughs> I'm more partial to Friday 13th, but um, so your upcoming movie 13 fanboy, can you give the listeners a plot summary of um, like, cause it's such a cool idea. Right. A homicidal maniac who with a deadly obsession um, is stalking uh, women from Friday the 13th and also Dee Wallace from Halloween. So he's a huge slasher fan and um, he takes that love for too far. He um, started writing when he was a kid, he was abused and uh, would be locked in a basement. And the only thing he had with him were the um, his VHS tapes of Halloween and Friday the 13th. And so he'd watch them over and over and over again. And for him, we became his friends, his family. And he would write and write and write, but we didn't write back. Oh, oh. It's a bad choice. <laughs> oh no! So I, I'm so interested how this project came to be. Like, how did you come up with the idea, and when did you start working on it? Because, like Tim said, it's such a cool idea, and I just, I just want to, yeah, I want to know where it started and how that happened. When, um, I mean, I had been looking for a while uh, to do something horror related for the fans, and a lot of them had been talking about. You know, well, couldn't you do another Friday the 13th? Well, of course, you've got legal issues there, so you can't do that. Or they were like, you know, maybe something bring all the final girls together and they can fight Jason. Still legal issues. And um, and those really didn't interest me as much, even though they there's some interesting ideas in there. What interests me was having something that's more chilling. To me, I can watch this movie and you know, it doesn't, it, it, yeah, I have the jump scares and I, ah, oh, yay, you know, all the kind of fun things. But after it's over, when you're in the parking lot, you're not like this thinking that the undead Jason's coming for you or, you know, something like that. Um, but in this movie, it is something that could actually happen. And so I was talking with my um, producer, my uh, producing partner. And uh, we were actually talking about doing a different film when he asked about it. And um, he had never been to a horror convention um, and was just wondering, what is it like? What are horror fans like? And he thought, are they scary? (laughs) No, I said, I, I, he, I said, you know, you're basically hanging around with a bunch of kids who like to dress up for Halloween. You know, they're just fun. They're yeah. just yeah, you're nope. point, he's pointing at you. <laughs> yes, he points at me. Well, I mean, I also love the holiday. He knows. And so, yeah, but yeah, uh, you know, so, sorry, go on. So, yes, the fans. So then he asked me, well, have you had anything creepy happen? I said, well, not at a horror convention, but there have been a few situations. Um, I had an on a guy online who... It's hard to say he was a stalker, but um, he continues to try to get to me um, through online means. And he's um, he is very obsessive. If um, I tried, I try to friend as many fans as I can, but Facebook limits you to five thousand. Mm-hmm. So as long as somebody's polite and nice, I'm fine with that. That doesn't bother me at all. And um, and so I just clicked when I realized he was a fan and, you know, I um, then he he would send me a message in Messenger 
and say, ask me something. And literally 10 minutes later, would be, I would when I'd open it up, then there'd be this string of messages. And he's getting angry and angry and angrier because I haven't responded. Oh, God. And um, then he got my home phone number and started calling me at my house. And then for some reason, he was sending me naked pictures of myself. And I'm like going, I do know what I look like. What? Wow. Not really in need of naked pictures of myself. Hey, remember this? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. And um, so I tried many times to set boundaries with him. And um, I finally had to block him. And he still continues to try and wiggle his way back in. He's tried apologizing. I usually will give somebody a, a one apology kind of thing. And if you completely quit doing what you were doing, then I'm cool with you. And it, it's not that um, I don't believe that he doesn't deserve forgiveness because that's that's definitely not like me. I really do believe that every human being on this planet deserves forgiveness. But that doesn't mean I need to put myself in a position of being abused by that person. And so that one situation um, definitely contributed to it. And then um, I had one send me a message on Facebook that said, wouldn't it be cool if you died in real life like you did in Friday the 13th? That's scary. That was scary. But yeah. then I got a string of messages on my personal phone again. And this time I was in my office and my office has a double French doors. And I didn't at the time have any curtains or anything on them. I live out in the middle of nowhere and um, I have, you know, on some land. And so it's nothing but trees out there and mountains and stuff. And it was late at night and first text, I'm watching you. Shut up. I don't like could that. Have been, and I was working at my desk. They, they literally could have been watching me at that moment. That's terrifying. And, um, but as time went on, you realize that he knew I was in Friday the 13th. He was pretending to be Jason. Oh. I'm going to get into that he didn't understand it was a copycat. But <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, hey, uh, we got to clear up one little detail about my movie. That's when you text him back, you dumbass. No, <laughs> it's you're Roy. Like, you're like, are you Roy or Jason? Because let's get this together. <laughs> wow. And so if you're going to threaten me, threaten me properly. If you're threatening me. <laughs> That's not my movie. <laughs> not my movie. Wow. I mean, okay, now I'm seeing directly how the idea for this movie came up. I, I will say, Hi. I just want to put it out there that hopefully you, most of the horror fans you've met are more just like, I mean, loving, yeah. really dedicated people because a lot of people, you know, Tim and I, like I said, have grown up loving, loving, loving this genre. And it's easy for right. people to say, oh, you love these movies. Are you some kind of weirdo? And we're like, no, we just, it's just like a, a genre, a genre that we love and we're very dedicated and we're so grateful and like eager and just like happy to talk with people like you. Right. So hopefully that is a, the, uh, not the norm. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, by far, 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 um, most of the fans are absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that what sometimes people don't understand, and that included me at one time, because before I started meeting fans, I didn't know what to expect. And I was a little bit nervous, particularly with my type of role, you know, being nude and everything. What did, how was that interaction going to be? But I have found 99% of everybody is nothing but extremely respectful. And good. that's good to hear. Nice. So you do get some occasional where you're just like, oh, okay, it really would like you to move on right now. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, nah, but security. for the most part, no. But for the most part, just absolutely lovely. And um, so when Joel and I were, were talking, he was like, that's our movie. I'm like, no. <laughs> that's real life. You know, it's that little piece in the back of your mind that says that can happen. Yeah. This could, this is real. True. The things that scare you the most are the things that can truly happen to yeah. you. It's a great right. point. I mean, right. I just want to real quick for listeners, 
I want to list off all of the Friday the 13th alumni that you've gotten for this film because it's pretty okay. damn spectacular. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I okay. think I got it right. <laughs> okay. okay. So obviously we have you, Deborah Voorhees, who played Tina from A New Beginning. We have Tracy Savage, who played Debbie in part three. We have Corey Feldman, who played Tommy Jarvis from the final chapter. We have Judy Aronson, who played Samantha from the final chapter. Mm -hmm. Ron Sloan, who was in A New Beginning with you and played Junior. We have mm -hmm. CJ Graham, who played Jason and Jason Lives. We have mm -hmm. uh, Lar Park Lincoln, who played mm -hmm. Tina from The New Blood. Jennifer Banco, who played the young version of Tina in The New Blood. Right. And the all-time favorite or, or just classic Jason, Kane Hodder, who played Jason in The New Blood, Jason Takes Manhattan, Jason Goes to Hell, Jason X. And then, of course, in addition to all these people, we have the horror icon herself from Cujo, the Howling Critters, E.T., D. Wallace. Yes, that's exactly right. Wow, did I miss anyone? And how were you able to get so many people involved? Pick up the phone. Uh <laughs> That's the universe working for you again. When you put it out there, you know, once I start moving on a project and I'm 100% certain that's where I'm going, there's a period of time where I'm kind of working through and trying to decide if a project will work or not. Once it happens and you're done, you just don't stop. There's a thousand obstacles that'll step up in your way. You just keep going, move them out of the way, keep moving, no matter what. Um, Never, I mean, no film would be made unless you have an attitude of no matter how many obstacles come up, you push them out of the way. 100%. I love 100%. that. 100% agree. You have to just keep going and push forward. Yeah. Um, I noticed that the Friday 13th alumni play themselves, except for Corey Feldman, you decided right. not to have him play himself also? Right. That's yeah, what, correct. What, what made you come to that decision with him versus all the other ones playing themselves? And him it was playing actually him? his choice. Initially, we wanted him to, we asked him to play himself. Um, he agreed to do the part as long as he could be playing a character and rather than playing himself. Some of it probably is because the a lot of the characters, um, we try to write it with them specifically in mind so that there were true aspects to their life because they are truly playing themselves. Although a fictionalized version, there are elements like D is a very loving, kind person. And so we have things like that with King. He's had some struggles because he has, he, he may be a horror icon, but he hasn't been taken as seriously as an actor. And there have been roles he wanted to go for and hasn't gotten because they still want him to be the silent killer. Hmm. Damn good actor. And so that aspect, is drawn into here. Um, and we brought this in for many people to try and do it. In his particular case, um, the role we were looking at him for was that of a, a really kind of sleazy producer, it really didn't fit him at all. And so I think that it made more sense for him to play a role as opposed to playing himself. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Back to Dee Wallace, you know, we absolutely love her, you know, as horror fans. What I right. think we love most about her is that she's never shied away from continuing to star in films of the genre, like all throughout right. her career. She just seems to fully embrace it. And we love that. Are there, mm -hmm. do you have any um, fun stories from working with Dee or any of the other horror stars starstruck by her? <laughs> I think we definitely had quite a few people who were pretty starstruck. She, um, it was an, an honor uh, to work with her. She is a super kind, caring person. And um, I know it only got, was able to direct her, but I also performed in a scene with her. And that was quite an honor. Um, I was a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But um, she was uh, very gracious and... Uh, very kind. Um, yeah, she's she's just, um, gosh, I just can't say enough about her. She's just an amazing human being and um, quite funny <laughs> as well. 
<laughs> That's awesome. That's so good to hear, especially as fans. You know, was there mm -hmm. anyone from the Friday the 13th series that wanted to be in the film but just couldn't make it work or anyone you asked that just like flat out refused for some reason? Tom Matthews, we were going to have him play the role of a detective. But um, we uh, had set up our schedule and we had to make a fast change in our schedule uh, for Corey coming in. And um, actually either of them, the dates that we had available, Tom wasn't able to, but we were having to shoot Corey and Kane at the same time. And I had too many wheels in more motion to change a date again. Mm -hmm. Corey and Kane were both so packed, I really had a small window to grab them. And he was leaving um, to go with his family to Europe and was going to be gone. Not It, it wasn't like he, a, a day change or anything, in which actually I couldn't even have done that because Corey and Kane, they literally had the days they gave me and they were on to just something else. And um, so uh, he wasn't able to make it. But he sent me a very nice note afterward and said, you know, maybe if you do part two, we can do something. Um, about Adrian doing something, Adrian King from the first film doing something. Um, but as most people know, she was stalked in real life. Yes. And for her, the script was too close for comfort and just didn't want to get anywhere near it. Totally get that. Yeah. We yeah. we love Tom Matthews. We actually yeah. had him on the podcast a few months mm -hmm. ago. I mean, he's I, I love he's again, someone who's continuing like in other films as Tom right. Jarvis and just embracing this. It's just again, there there's nothing better as fans of these movies and seeing not only actors like you um embracing them, but continuing these legacies. It's just like right. the best thing possible for people like us so there are 12 friday 13 films is there anyone like that you just be like if you could pick and choose like who would you pick if you could have one additional yeah. person like one more actor. any of the 12 films in this oh film? gosh i don't know <laughs> i don't know i my hope is to um do a part two. Ooh. So we'll have to see if the fans um, respond to it. Well, we're getting um, starting to get a lot of really good publicity. Um, we've been on in um, L.A. quite a bit, in um, Australia, um, some different shows around the country. Most horror publications have been picking up with picking us up and uh, Yahoo News picked us up and uh, think it'll continue to, to grow. And so uh that would be my hope is to do another one. And we could have a whole new group of people. I mean, yeah. you, right. you have definitely a ton of people to choose from with all the films, right? Right. That is so amazing. We have um one final question for you. Okay. And we have thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you so yes, much. Seriously. Thank you so much. We, we cannot wait to see this film. Again, 13 thank Fanboy you. being released in theaters and on demand October, October 22nd, 22nd, just in time. For Halloween, you're going to see all these incredible people from the Friday the 13th franchise that I listed out. So if you are a fan, you cannot miss this, seriously. Um, our one final question for you now, we ask everyone we interview. It's a little bit putting okay. on the spot, but that's how we like to do it. Um, what is one thing you can tell us about your experience working on Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning, that you've never told any other interviewer, publication, <laughs> podcaster, meaning something you've just never told at a convention, just one little tidbit about that experience you've never told anyone. And it can be really tiny. Like it doesn't have to be like, you or know. it can be earth shattering. It can be, it can <laughs> blow our minds. I, I don't know. Um, hmm. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I told the best gems. Oh, yeah, well, you really did. Well, you did tell us that John Robert Dixon had to be fully naked during that scene too. So that's a nice. Yeah, yeah I didn't know that. That's yep. a good one. We didn't know mm -hmm. that. Yeah. That's right. There you go. Yeah. You know <laughs> I don't think anybody's asked me that question. So you guys, that would that would be it. Is I don't I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, we got our exclusive tidbit. Well, again, we just want to thank you so much for taking the time. Um, like I said, we can't wait for the movie. We'll be um we'll keep in touch with you as to when exactly the episode's gonna thank come you. out. And 
Sure. And I, I also want to thank you guys so much um, for having me on. I really appreciate you taking the time and you guys are absolutely adorable. <laughs> well, thank you. Right thank you so you. much. This was so <laughs> much fun. This was so much fun. Well, we wish you nothing but the best been. of success with 13 Fanboy. Thank and like you. I said, we'll, we'll be seeing it. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Take care, guys. Okay, take thank care. You. Bye. 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 We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. This podcast is hosted by Matt Emmer and myself, Tim Murdoch. It's co-produced by Jacob Randall, who also hosts a great true crime podcast, Crime of Your Life. Please check out our website, happyhorrortime.com, where you can stream all of our episodes and see all our pretty little episode images. You can also follow our social media pages on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Happy Horror Time. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you want to contact us about one of our recent episodes, send us an email at happyhorrortime at gmail.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, please sign up to be a patron at patreon.com slash happy horror time. Patrons get access to our growing library of bonus episodes where we discuss older horror films, look back at popular franchises, and all kinds of other fun horror stuff. I'm Tim Murdoch. And I'm Matt Emmert. And we, we hope, hope you have a happy, happy horror time. time.